Good morning, friends, from the Sanctuary of First Congregational Church in Fort Worth. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Happy Mother's Day to all of the people who nurture and support others. Thanks for taking time together in worship, seeing everyone log in and post comments every week to greet one another. Just makes my week. I especially enjoyed today popping into the coffee chat on Zoom that we're having before. Um, feel free to check that out. We're doing that every week from 9.30 to 10, and if you need the Zoom link, please contact the church office. A special appreciation for people who show up here to worship, who continue to make time to worship at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. It's just one of the ways that we can stay connected in community, so thank you for doing your part of keeping us in touch with each other. A special welcome to folks who are worshiping for the first time. Add a comment to let people know and then other folks will be able to greet you too. Today we're back with our full tech team and we had planned to incorporate a series of videos in worship. Unfortunately, it's been kind of a stressful moment for Robert and Lauren because the broadcast equipment is not able to connect with Facebook Live. So we're able to do the live portion, but we're not able to integrate the videos as we had planned. You will see the videos at some point very soon because they're very, very cool. Whether or not we post them separately on Facebook or save them for next week, we'll give that some thought and do the best we can to get them to you quickly. So let's begin worship as we do every service at First Congregational Church. Come, let everyone in all of our sacred spaces receive the love of God extended in and through this community. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Morning friends, happy Mother's Day. I hope you're doing good today and I wanted to just take a moment to share with you a couple of things and um, let you know I'm thinking about you. So I told you last week that I went to the classroom and I grabbed a few things and being that it's Mother's Day, I thought that I would just let you say hi to a couple of our little characters. We got a little 
maybe mommy, baby situation. Make sure you treat your mama sweet today. And then back here we got a little owl mama. Woohoo. And her little owl baby who she visits and makes sure she gets taken care of. I wonder how the sun is like a mother <laughs> or a father. So I wanted to read a couple of just poems to you. And it comes from, they come from this sweet book that I found at the library. And then I found all my library books in the classroom. <laughs> Oops. It's called Dancing Teepees. So they're poems um, of American Indian youth. So I like this one. It's called Sun, Moon, Stars. Sun, moon, stars, you that move in the heavens. Hear this, mother. A new life has come among you. Make its life smooth. That was from an Omaha ceremony for the new board. And there's another one. I really love this one too because it helps me remember to be the kind of mother I want to be. It's called Nicely Nicely and there's a sweet little picture of, I think what appears to be rain. Nicely, nicely, nicely away in the east, the rain clouds care for the little corn plants as a mother cares for her baby. That's the Sunni corn ceremony. So if you have a chance today, maybe you can write a poem for your mom or read her something sweet. And I hope you have an awesome Mother's Day. We'll miss seeing you, but we'll be back next Sunday um, to continue our book about mammals who morph, the universe telling its story, and about those first little mama mammals, first little mama mammals that survived after the extinction of the dinos and their little babies. So I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, we'll see you on Thursdays at 1030 and on Sundays after worship. Okay, see you soon. Mm, I miss you. Bye. I know that one day I'll be free, deep down in my soul. I know that one day I'll be free, deep down in my soul. I know that one day I'll be free, deep down in my soul. I know that one day I'll be free. Deep down in my soul, I know that one day I'll be free. Deep down in my soul, I know that one day I'll be free. Deep down in my soul, I know that one day I'll be free. Deep down in my soul, deep in my soul, I know that one. Deep down.
down in my soul. I know that one day I'll be free. Deep down in my soul. I know that one day I'll be free. Deep down in my soul. Even though we are apart, we continue to join our hearts together in prayer. And today we have another prayer written by Reverend Kathy Bowser. If you'd like to share a prayer with the community, feel free to post a comment. We'll start with the time of centering silence. I will invite the bell. I know that it's hard to focus on a screen, but do your best right now to find a place of stillness to stop what you're doing just for a moment so that we can join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. What kind of a day is today, oh God? It's a day to recognize the goodness and love of our mothers. It's a day to give thanks for all that mothers so freely give away to their children. It's a day to hold with tenderness the ways that even mothers can fall short of the ideal. Today we might even consider how your steadfast love for all of us, no matter how often we might miss the mark, is the perfect model for all the mother love that we have experienced in our lives. Yet today, Mother God, some of your children are feeling overwhelmed. We're confused and disoriented in this time of coronavirus. We're scared for our loved ones, scared for ourselves. Some of us are just plain scared. Some find it hard to get up in the morning with energy and joy, hard to keep on doing what we used to do, hard to focus on things that once were easy, even routine for us. Today we open ourselves to feel your abiding presence, O oh God that you breathe peace and hope into our hearts. Give clarity to our minds. Strengthen our willpower. And now we pause to pray, aloud or silently, what is on our hearts. A prayer for those whose mothers have died over the past year. Prayers for those who flaunt CDC guidelines. Prayers for our children who have been asked to change so much so quickly. Prayers for those who are fearful, but who feel pressured by friends, family, or employers to go to gatherings, stop social distancing, not wear masks. Prayers of gratitude for our beloved community and our strength to persevere. Gratitude for all the women who have mothered me and continue to do so 
particularly in this community. Prayers for all mothers, whether biological, spiritual, or emotional. Prayers for the Escobar family. Their sweet boy, Carter, lost his battle with cancer. Prayers for prisoners everywhere. Prayers for a just world for people of color. Prayers to all mothers who can't be with their children and grandchildren today. Prayers of gratitude for being a mother to three beautiful women. Help us to remember, O oh God, that you are always with us. And most especially today and each day, we go through hard times. Amen. Our modern lesson today is quite familiar to many of us. It's written by Reinhold Niebuhr. And I always want to point out that Reinhold Niebuhr was ordained in, <clears throat> excuse me, in our denomination. Well, not precisely the United Church of Christ, but in the German Evangelical Synod of North America, which is one of the denominations that became the United Church of Christ. This excerpt is from a sermon that he wrote from which the serenity prayer has evolved. This is a direct quote. I don't love his use of gender exclusive language, but I've left it as it is. I don't resonate with some of his theology that comes through in this quote. However, you know, whether we are spiritual or not, <clears throat> we don't have to agree completely to recognize each other's gifts. We would all do well, in my opinion, to live by the spirit of this quote by Reinhold Niebuhr. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, <clears throat> trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Last week we began our worship series on spiritual resiliency. How might we develop the ability to live from a place of deep centeredness and calm that is not dependent on circumstance? This morning, I'm having a good opportunity to practice that. <laughs> this extended period of disruption to our normal routines is unprecedented. Yes, it is filled with uncertainty. It's proving to be extremely challenging for many of us. Spiritual leaders such as Michael Singer, whom we talked about last week, remind us, though, that this moment is essentially no different from any other moment. He says, we live in two worlds, the inside world and the outside world. It's always like that. A person has no control over the outside world. It unfolds as it will in ways that are welcomed at times and unwelcomed at times. The inside world, the interior world, is a different story. A person has the ability to control the inside world the center of consciousness, clarity, and power. Even if the outside world is scary, it doesn't have to come into the interior self, to the inside world. So over the next week, we'll keep talking about how a person can develop a sort of spiritual resiliency that will allow them to take charge of their inside world, even when the outside world is very difficult. And I've come to the conclusion that this time of shutdown is the perfect moment to do that sort of interior work. 
we're all in the same position of needing to be quarantined and in our homes as much as possible. On the outside, things are scary in ways that are particular to each one of us, depending on our circumstances. The question is, will we fight this moment, kicking and screaming, or will we use it? Will we use this time to help us grow and learn more about ourselves? This could be the moment of practice that can carry us through the rest of our lives. Wisdom is available to us from so many sources, and it's never been more accessible. The Christian tradition offers tried and true ancient practices and texts, as do all religious traditions. There are contemporary spiritual teachers online every day. On YouTube, you can find sermons and talks and courses from almost anyone you admire. And if you don't know who to look for, there are countless organizations that will send you devotion a day or devotion a week that cull through and find the very best, most helpful information. Today, I'm going to share from recovery addiction resources. Some of my family members have struggled with drug and alcohol addiction over the years. And I've seen firsthand, as have many of you, how helpful some of the strategies and ways of thinking are that come from the field of addiction recovery. I recently came across an article, it's put out by Virginia Commonwealth University, by a campus organization that supports students with substance abuse issues. And it just reminded me that people in recovery from addiction know stuff. They know stuff that can help them endure very difficult times with strength and dignity. And many of those practices are enormously helpful right now for anyone who might be struggling during this time of disruption. I'm gonna quickly go through 10 points that originate in recovery addiction wisdom and then apply them to our current reality of living through a pandemic. It may seem strange to begin here, but number one is give up. The fight is fixed, things cannot be changed. That's a central tenet of recovery. People in recovery must accept that they cannot control their substance use once they start using. This allows them to move forward with a goal of not using at all. In the same way, we have to accept the reality of COVID before we can navigate it. We're quarantined, we're anxious about loved ones or about ourselves, maybe we've lost a job, maybe we're concerned about the continued economic fallout. To accept this reality is not to be defeated by it. Acceptance helps us to move forward and do things that we need to do reach out to friends, or file for unemployment. Challenge those in power to do better. Number two, halt. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Have you ever been hangry? You know, that experience where you're hungry and you just cannot function well until you eat something? It's not pretty. You're sort of out of control of yourself. Whether you're in recovery or enduring a pandemic, it's imperative to pay attention to yourself and to how you're feeling. This kind of awareness can help us kind of keep it together so we can be there for our friends, our families, our communities. You can't pour from an empty cup. Take care of your own needs first. And in order to do that, you need to know what your own needs are first. Number three, progress, not perfection. People will stumble in recovery, particularly early on. Not everyone will relapse, some do. Not everyone relapses, but 
They'll have emotional outbursts or make poor decisions. Maybe they'll feel overwhelmed at times. To succeed in recovery, you have to keep trying anyway. It's a lot like that in isolation. Some days are tough. Some days are very tough. But it's never too late to do one small thing that can turn that hard day around, that can improve your well-being. Things like step outside, drink a glass of water, call a friend, get some exercise, draw a picture, do something creative. Living with this new normal, living in general, is a learning process for all of us. We need to lighten up on ourselves. Number four, peace amid the storm, not freedom from it. People in recovery learn to face life head on without substances to numb them. They learn to exist alongside difficult circumstance instead of running away from it. Life in a pandemic is challenging. Life will always be challenging. It's not about finding a life without challenge. The goal is resilience, the ability to rebound in the face of inevitable hardship. Number five, one day at a time. Early in recovery, people get caught up in wondering if they're gonna make it in sobriety or not. It's scary to think of never using again. And it's so easy now to get caught up in worrying about how long is this going to last? How bad will things get? Could this be the practice round for an even bigger one down the road? Instead of trying to predict what's going to lie ahead, focus on doing the next right thing, even if it seems small. Number six, service transforms pain. Service to others is one of the most important pillars of addiction recovery. Painful experiences can be transformed into meaningful ones if a person can bring newfound knowledge and energy back into helping other people who are struggling. The pain that we feel right now is an invitation to deepen our empathy. We benefit by reaching out to others who are struggling. It doesn't have to be in giant ways. It could have a giant impact even if it's a small thing. Call someone who might be having a hard time. Write a letter to someone you appreciate and haven't thought about in a long time. Write a letter to someone in prison I can connect you with someone if you would like to have a name. Think about what your life is like and what it would be like to be imprisoned right now. Every week in our online newsletter, there are ways that you can help right now. Number seven, gratitude. Remembering what we still have and the ways in which we're fortunate is a great buffer against hardship. People in recovery sometimes struggle to break free of the assumption that everything is awful. Listing things to be grateful for challenges that assumption and encourages perseverance. Want to get started with gratitude? It's easy. Just open your eyes. Look around the room in which you're sitting right now. I'm here with my friends Robert and Lauren. The morning has not gone as we wish, but we're here together, engaged in this ministry together. What about you? If you're alone, do you pretty much have what you need? People are food deprived now. You're probably not. And if you are, all you have to do is call me. This church can help. 
Are there people who love you? A pet who depends on you? Are you quarantined with someone who's actually pretty good company? Are your children receiving a good education? Just make a list of all the things that you're grateful for and then do it again tomorrow. Gratitude is a feel-good emotion that can supersede fear. Number eight, surviving and thriving. It's often said that people don't get into recovery to drop out of life, but to get back into life. We're certainly focused on surviving in this moment, yes, but we can also be laying the groundwork for a brighter future. We could focus on what we cannot do. In recovery, you can't use drugs or alcohol. In quarantine, we can't gather face to face. We can't hug. But think of all of the things we still can do. We can exercise, learn, connect virtually, read, do art. We can learn a completely new skill. We can survive. And what we do now can help us to thrive. Number nine, mutual aid, not self-help. There are many paths to recovery, but every one of them involves community. Addiction, like a pandemic, can lead to isolation and disconnection. In order to survive and grow, we need each other. And if you're listening now, congratulations, you've found a community that you can connect with, even now. And number 10, normal is just a setting on the dryer. People in recovery have learned through sitting in meetings over many, many years that there is no such thing as normal. Even though folks can lose years of their lives trying for it. Human beings, we can be so critical of ourselves for not measuring up that we become blind to what is unique or beautiful or possible in ourselves or in a situation such as this. People in recovery often find that when they can acknowledge and embrace the parts of themselves they were once ashamed of, they are able to grow. And if we can acknowledge what we perceive as limitations to our situation right now, it can become a place to thrive. There's no single right way to do a pandemic. I mean, there are some wrong things that you can do, <laughs> make no mistake, but there are lots of ways to do it right. It's okay to be very anxious or to not be anxious at all. You can wear pajamas all day. Robert and Lauren are both wearing their pajamas right now. <laughs> you can eat pancakes for dinner. You can read or nap or do neither. You can stay up late, Zoom with friends to stay in touch, or not Zoom at all if you're exhausted by looking at screens all the time. Nothing about this time is normal. If you're keeping yourself and others safe, as safe as you can, and if you're continuing to work at any pace on your own well-being, then you're doing great. Mm -hmm. Now next week we'll continue with our series on spiritual resiliency. We'll even welcome a very special guest. That's a little teaser. In the meantime, over the coming week, please know that your church is here for you. Your pastor loves you. If you're struggling, reach out. Friends, may God bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace. Amen. Often and 
Don't touch your face The virus is something That no one deserves Now gather on Skype Gather on Zoom Gather by phone With family and friends Gather online But don't leave your room this crisis ends. Y'all be safe. Stay home.